I have organized the IEEE Signal Processing Cap 2021 on the topic of configuring an intelligent reflecting surface for wireless communications. And in this video, I will tell you about the result and provide you with my sample solution and also tell you about how you can continue working on this problem using the new dataset that I have put online. So the problem statement in this cap is that you are given a dataset containing uh, transmitted and received signals that are reflected by an intelligent reflecting surface. This is a surface containing 4096 elements. Each one of them is claimed to be able to have two different states that are creating different phase shifts that are supposed to be 180 degrees apart. And by changing the pattern on the surface here, watch phase shift that different elements are creating, the signal that is impinging on the surface should be reflected with different directivities. It could be a beam in a particular direction, or it could be something else, just a diffuse scattering. So while a typical metal surface, for example, would have the same configuration everywhere, then with an intelligent reflecting surface, we can tune how a signal is being reflected. And the goal here is to find good configuration for 50 different users that are located in roughly the same location, but not exactly. And for each one of them then have one configuration that is tuned for this user. And the winning team is maximizing the weighted sum rate and provides a good solution that can be explained in a neat manner. So one of the big challenges here is that we cannot test all possible solutions. Because even if there's only two states per element here, there are two to the power of 4096 possible configurations, which means that this is essentially more than the number of atoms in the known part of the universe. So we need to design a smart algorithm, and that is what the challenge has been about. And the final result was that the team called T-cubed from Sri Lanka won, and the first runner-up was a team called AGH from Poland, and the second runner-up was a team called Unbounded from Brazil. And I will tell you about my solution in this video, and also tell you something about the data set that wasn't known when the competition started, and finally also compare my solution with the solutions that these other teams have provided. So it was only said that there were 4096 different elements in the iris, but the shape of it wasn't declared in the challenge. The truth is that it was a array which was 64 by 64, a square array here or uniform a planar array it's called. The distance between every element was 0.4 wavelengths and 4 gigahertz was a wavelength that this entire communication system was built on. The kind of setup looked like this, there were an iris at one location, there were an access point that was um, at this location, this, so this is the origin, and the access point is at 40 meters down and minus 100 meters to the left here. And then the signal is transmitted from the access point. It could make it to the users directly, but uh, there is an online of sight uh, a kind of path here, and there's a wall that needs to be go through to reach the U's that are all located in a big room here, which is 12 by 13 meters large. And however, this IRS here have a line of sight path to the access point. So it might be put on neighboring building and there might be a window uh, through which the signal can make it into the room. There's a number of scattering elements inside the room uh, on which the signals can be scattered in order to reach users, or it can go directly. And for most users, there's a direct path to the a user from the iris, but not for all of them. And uh, this is then the particular setup that was considered. And uh, when it comes to modeling the channels, array response vectors that has to do with arrays of this type was utilized in order to model them. Uh, so there were a geometry that was used in addition to random delays and random uh, scattering losses on different objects around here. When it comes to channel estimation set up like this, uh, well, we need to set a model for what kind of system we're having. And the starting point could be to assume that we have a linear system model. And this reference here that was provided uh, in the description of the challenge is providing a linear system model. 
that could be utilized. In that case, what we are getting in dataset 1 is received signals over all the subcarriers in this OFTM system when we are using 4 times n, and n was the number of element, that many different configurations. We transmit the same pilot over and over again, and we are then testing what will be the received signal. So the received signal is then created by adding noise to a transmitted signal, and the transmitted signal have a power that is given by this term. It goes through a direct channel, so this direct channel is a m by 1 channel vector, so m is the number of subcarriers, and then we have the controllable channel that goes via the RS, and uh, this one is also having a dimension of m, which is the number of subcarriers, but it also have n, which is the number of elements. And for each of them, they have a particular configuration for each of the pilot transmissions. So this is essentially a system model. And if this is a time domain channels with different channel taps, m of them, then there is a m by k dft matrix that is transforming that into the different subcarriers. And if you have a model like this, what can we do in order to estimate these two channel components? Well, we can try to invert matrices. We should notice that the DFT matrix and this matrix here with ones that has to do with all of the elements from the direct channel and the pilot matrix, uh, these are not uh, square matrices. So the regular type of inverse cannot be utilized. However, there is the concept of pseudo inverse that can be utilized if the matrices have full rank, which they will have in dataset one. So a least squares estimate can be obtained by dividing with this factor, by multiplying from the left with the pseudo inverse of the DFT matrix, and that is a backslash operator in MATLAB, and multiplying from the right with the pseudo inverse of this matrix. So in that way, we will get an estimate of both the direct channel and the channel that is the controllable part via the IRS. And if we are analyzing that channel, in particular, we take out the first uh, column of it, then it's a 4096 length um, channel. And we don't know in the challenge that we have a kind of a square array with 64 by 64 elements. But if you start analyzing it, you can see patterns. And if you are ordering them, seeing that the elements are ordered uh, row by row, you can see that within each column of the array, we have essentially the same value in our estimates. So here I'm showing the real path of this first column, and uh, we can see that they are more or less the same within every column. So this kind of structure is there in the data to discover. And the explanation, the physical explanation for this structure is that all of the radio waves that are considered in this channel model here are coming in through it, the same horizontal plane. So if the elements are located at different vertical heights, well, that makes no difference because there is a plane wave coming in and is hitting all those elements in the same way. So this is something that we can utilize to have the same channel coefficient within each of the columns. Another complication that is there in the data set which wasn't declared is that actually this linear system model that I was just describing isn't exact. There is non-linear behaviors. And one of them have to do with the two different configurations that the, uh, these different elements can have. So there are two different states, on and off. And if we are looking at the phase response at the four gigahertz frequency, what we can see is that they are essentially plus 90 degree and minus 90 degree. So as was mentioned, they are approximately 180 degrees apart. Not exactly, but good enough in order to utilize that property. However, there was nothing said about the amplitudes that the different RS elements were going to have for these two different states. And in practice, they are typically not exactly the same. They might be approximate the same, but not exactly. And in this case, we can see here that when the element is turned to the off mode, well, then we have an amplitude response of 0.95%. So 95% of the impinging amplitude is still left in the reflected signal. 
while if we're turning on the element, uh, we are shifting the phase and we're also losing an additional 5% on the amplitude here. So there are some mismatches there. They are not large, but still important enough in order to make the linear system model inexact. Another effect is that there is some kind of mutual coupling between elements. So the neighboring elements, we are turning on and off the switches to them in order to select what configuration you have. But depending on what the configuration of the neighboring ones are, the reflection coefficients will be changed. So the way that this is modeled here is that if you assign a particular capacitance to one element in order to map that to a particular um, phase shift, then the true capacitance that you get is only determined by like 45% by what you assign to it and also uh, influenced by the, the uh, elements that are around. So this is creating some strange effects and a lot of the elements that are around might have still the same configuration. So it might not have a big impact on the performance, but it will create some small variations that makes it hard to get an exact modeling in practice. So my sample solution is still based on that we are utilizing the things that I described earlier. So we use equal coefficients within each column and we exploit the linear system model. So even if we are suspecting or I even knew that there were a non-linear model underneath, I was approximating it as being linear. And this periodicity that we have the same channel coefficient within each column of the errors means that we have only 64 parameters describing the channel instead of 64 times 64 which is reducing the dimensions a lot. So if this V matrix that is describing the channel is 4096 times M, it's actually only described by a 64 times M matrix. And then one can create some kind of projection matrix that is expanded dimensions and map every uh, element on a particular column here to having the same one within uh, the entire column. So this one is containing what you have along one of the rows and at the different channel tabs. If we're now looking at dataset 2 and we're utilizing this property, we can look say that the received signal have a similar shape as before. But what I have changed now is that instead of having V, the channel matrix here, I have V row here. And I have then taken this uh, matrix here that's expanded dimension and moved it so it's multiplied with the pilot matrix because this one is known. And the important thing uh, here is that this is one of the necessary things in order to get the problem that we can solve. So if, if we would like to apply the same mechanism as before without having the A here and having the original V here, well then this matrix here won't have full rank. So if you try to invert it, that won't work. But now by reducing the rank like this or reducing the dimensions of E rather, we can change the, so we can compute a least square estimate in the same way as before. We take a pseudo inverse of this matrix, multiply from the right, we take a pseudo inverse of the DT matrix from the left, and in that way we are getting our estimates of both the direct channel and the channel that we have in any row of these IRS. When it comes to configuring the IRS based on our estimates, what can we do? Well, there are many different heuristic approaches that one can take, and it's not possible, even if you know the channel, to go through all possible configurations. So what I did in my sample solution was to say that we can actually write the total received power as a quadratic form like this, where C is a configuration matrix. So it contains a one because there is no phase shift on the direct path, but we can model it as being a phase shift of one. And then we have this element here, which is describing what is the phase shifts that we are applying to the first column, the second, and so on. So there are 64 different ones here, and all of them should ideally be one or minus one. And if we're multiplying from the right and the left here with this matrix B, which is containing our estimates of the direct channel and the channel that we have for the different elements on one row and multiply with the number of rows, well then this will be an approximation of the total received power. And if you would like to find the C vector that is maximized in a quadratic form like this, 
if we don't have any particular constraint on that we need to have 1 and minus 1 in this vector here, what we could do is to apply something called the power method, where we are taking one value of c, multiplied with b, and then we are taking the result, normalize it to have length 1, and then multiply again, and then we do this over and over again in an iterative manner. So we start from some kind of c value, we multiply with b, we project it in the sense of changing the length of it, uh, and then we get a new one, we multiply it like this, and then we iterate this over and over again. And such a algorithm will find the dominant eigenvector of a matrix. And if we don't have any particular constraint apart from that c should have a particular norm, well then that will be the optimal solution here. But we have the issue that we only want to have 1 and minus 1 in our vector. And in my sample solution, what I did was to mimic this power method, but in the projection uh, occasion here, what I'm changing this function to is one where we are first rotating the result so that we get a one in the first element because we cannot control the uncontrollable channel. And then for the, all of the other elements, I am taking it as if you have a positive real part, I put it to plus one. If it has a negative real part, I take it to minus one. And that gives me my new solution. And then I iterate this over and over again until convergence and make sure that I try to get a higher rate every time. And what was then the result with my sample solution? Well, here I'm showing the data rates that the 50 different users are getting from one of the 50. And I haven't ordered them here in the way that they were appearing in the data set, but rather I took my solution and I ordered the users in performance order to get a curve that is easier to view here. So what we can see are four different curves here. The lowest one is if I assign all of the elements to be to have the configuration minus one, which is essentially like turning off, is approximating to have a uniform surface, like a metal surface. And then we can see that all the users are getting a rather bad performance since it oscillates up and down here. If I take the pilots that was utilized, there were 4,096 different pilots. If I go through each one of them, all of those configurations that were used in the pilot phase, I evaluate how much received power I get, I compute the uh, an approximation of the data rate, and I pick the best out of those, well then I get this blue curve, and uh, that will only explore 4096 of the possibly infinite number of different configurations. If I run my sample solution, I get the black curve here, which is better than the it's picking the best solution among those that were used in the pilot transmission phase. And it particularly for these users here, which are the non-line of sight users, that we see a large improvement. And for the line of sight users, there are some improvement, they are not as large. And finally, the red curve at the top here is taking the supremum, the best data rate that any of the teams were providing in the competition. So we can see that it's slightly above what I was obtaining with my sample solution all the time. So when it comes to the result in this competition, there were 37 participating teams that were submitting something and 30 of them submitted a result in the final round. I have shown the result here in terms of the metric that was computed. This is a weighted sum rate where we are taking the average of the rate for the line of sight users and two times the rate of the non-line of sight users because they typically had only half of the rates. So by doing that, we can see who are able to also design good algorithms that works well for non-line of sight cases, which are typically harder to configure. And I have ordered the teams here in terms of what metric value they are getting. And we can see that if I pick the best among the pilots, those that were transmitted in the pilot phase, then 103.56 is what you would get. And you can see that the vast majority of the teams were getting a result that was better than that, which means that they were able to design a good algorithm. My sample solution is ending up here at 117. And I would then make it to maybe uh, number 11 in the ranking. 
And what did the teams do that came above this? Well, the teams were typically starting from a solution similar to the sample solution and then applied some kind of additional gradient descent algorithms or some genetic algorithms in order to improve on the solution by searching in a smart manner for better and better solutions that are improving their metric. So the teams in the finals were the three that get the largest metric. And if you compare it by taking for every out of 50 users the largest rate that any other teams were providing, and you compute the metric based on that, that became 118.42. So we can see that none of the teams were providing the best rate for all of users, but there were many teams that were very close to that. And then in the final, it was based on the presentation and the things that meant that there wasn't this ranking that was the final one, but T cubed won, then team HH, and then Unbounded came on the third place. So if you would like to know more about the winning solutions, there are free videos on YouTube that you can watch for each of the different teams, and uh, that is telling you much more about the special algorithms that they were utilizing. And if you would like to continue to learn more about this competition, about my sample solution, for example, then you can find on archive this article, Optimizing a Binary Intelligent Reflecting Surface for OFDM Communication Under Mutual Coupling, where I'm describing the system model, I'm describing all the details of the data sets, how it was generated, and I describe how you are developing this sample solution in a rigorous manner. And on uh, GitHub, you can also find code solutions. So I've added a part in the repository containing a number of M files where you can, for example, test your own solution, test rate.m, that is the function I was utilizing in order to uh, evaluate the different teams. And when uh, computing the values, there is a file called true parameters that's going to be loaded. It contains, for example, which of the users were non-line of sight or line of sight users, what were the exact channels that we had. And it also uh, it needs to know about the mutual coupling effect. And if you would like to generate the data sets, you can utilize this file here, which is started from the beginning. It puts a random number generator to a particular state, so we can generate exactly the data sets again, even when they are disappearing from the internet. And finally, the plots from my article can also be regenerated using different methods. So with that, I would like to thank all the teams who was competing in this year's IEEE Signal Processing Cup. And I would like to congratulate all the winners for their great achievements. And I hope that you will find it interesting to continue performing research and analysis of intelligent reflecting surfaces.